Okay, so uh, welcome to the first talk of the 2020 uh, version of the speaker series on the ethics of argument. Um, as always, uh, we are recording the talk, but will not be recording the question period. Um, if you have a question, just uh, type your name or a cue uh, into the chat or even your whole question, because I'm happy to leave it out for you. If for some reason, you can't, uh, you don't have a microphone or something. Um, and it is now my immense pleasure to welcome to the speaker series one of Canada's and I think generally most important argumentation theorist, um, Dr. Trudy Gobi, who has uh, not only taught at Trent University, but also at the university that I'm currently employed at, at the University of Lethbridge, and who has written some of the most important argumentation theory we have. And um, today, uh, she's going to speak to us about argument and explanation, the pragmatics and ethics. And what we're going to do is I will be sharing my screen with the PowerPoint and Trudy is going to tell me when to go to the next slide. So I'll start doing that now. And then when you can see your PowerPoint, Trudy, then take it away. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Kat, for the kind introduction and for your assistance on this matter. I'm sorry that my video camera doesn't seem to be working. But thank you very much for everyone for attending this meeting. And I hope we can have a good discussion about these ideas. So can you go to the second screen, Kat? Um, so just to start off on this, um, there's a standard account of the distinction between argument and explanation. And this is an account that I broadly support. Um, an argument, as we all know, contains premise claims put forward in an effort to support a further claim, the conclusion. The arguer offers these premises as reasons or evidence to support the conclusion claim, and the effort generally presupposes that the premises are accepted and will ground a shift to the acceptance of the conclusion, which is typically in some context, in doubt, some doubt in the context in which the argument is put forward. Broadly speaking, the premises are to be presumed and are offered to, the to support the conclusion claim, which is generally in doubt. Explanations have a different balance of acceptance because the claim describing what is to be explained, the explanandum, is presumed to be true or accepted. There is or was an actual phenomenon, while the factors explaining it, the explanands, may be presumed. We can say then, that an argument, sorry, is to be anchored in its premises, whereas an explanation is to be anchored in its conclusion. So I've offered an, an elementary account along these lines in my textbook, and I've also written about the, the issue elsewhere. Um, I should explain that I'm articulating a distinction here, not a dichotomy. There is no exhaustive disjunction between argument and explanation because there are plenty of discourses that are neither argument nor explanation. These include descriptions, commands, narratives, and jokes, and I'm sure many other things. And there is not an exclusive disjunction because uh, there's not an exhaustive one and there's not an exclusive one because uh, there are some discourses that can count both as argument and as explanation. So I've been interested in this area for um, a while. I don't work on it uh, exclusively at all, but um, one reason for my interest was that students seem to have an inordinate amount of difficulty distinguishing between arguments and explanations. Uh, another one was that I wrote a PhD thesis about transcendental arguments, and in those arguments, explanation and um, in those arguments, explanation and argument are combined in kind of a, an unusual and tricky fashion. Then S. N. Thomas, an early textbook writer in the area of informal logic, had presented challenging examples, uh, which he described as constituting both argument and explanation. And on the grounds of those examples, Thomas had actually contained, maintained 
that the distinction between argument and explanation could just be given up. Um, and lastly, and this is the most fundamental point, I think, there are these significant similarities structurally between arguments and explanations. So now screen three, um, both of them offer answers to why questions. Both of them typically involve using indicator, indicator words such as since, because, so, hence, thus, and even therefore. And they may be set out in parallel ways as illustrated here. So if we look at these um, models, we can see this profound structural similarity. Um, we can also uh, still maintain the distinction saying broadly speaking that an argument offers justification whereas an explanation offers understanding. Now, there are some interesting complications here and I might just spend a few minutes discussing these. Um, not all arguments um, concern claims about which there is doubt or disagreement. Uh, can I have screen four, please? Um, so the, these, uh, these uh, examples have recently been discussed quite a lot and they are in context of uh, inquiry or deliberation. We may offer re for reasons for things which aren't in doubt. Um, on the explanation side of the distinction, it's not quite accurate to say that um, phenomena to be explained must be actual because we can often offer explanations as to how things are possible. And then there are further complications. Screen five, please. Um, there are discourses in which premises support a conclusion such that the phenomenon described in the conclusion can be explained when these premises are regarded as explanations. And these are the kinds of cases offered by S.N. Thomas. Um, this, was, this goes way back into the late 70s, early 80s. There are also discourses in which argument and explanation supplement each other. And these are considered in a recent account by Gregory Mays, um, which is quite interesting. Um, he works mainly on explanation, but um, he, he did consider this in an article in Informal Logic. And um, he, he maintains and argues quite persuasively that a discourse may contain both argument and explanation where these reasonings complement each other. One might, for example, offer an argument for a claim C and then with further statements, offer an explanation of the phenomenon described in C. Alternately, an argument might be needed to complete an explanation. For example, a claim put forward as part of an explanation might itself need argumentative support. So and to deal with another complication, um, there are hard to classify discourses where it is unclear which claims are to be presumed or rightly presumed and who is to decide that matter. And uh, Michel Dufour has uh, articulated this account. So and then uh, just to go on further, we need screen six now. Thanks. Um, there are abductive arguments in which an argument is offered in defense of an explanation. These, of course, are well known or um, in, on the grounds that it's the best or best available explanation. Um, and there are these transcendental arguments, which I was interested in long ago, where you get an argument to a claim, capital E, from the claim that X is possible, only if E is X possible. So X is possible or X is therefore E, that's an argument for E. And then you have an explanatory stage here, E being established, it's then cited as a factor explaining X. So this is the kind of thing that goes on a lot in Immanuel Kant and is of great interest. I became interested in this long, long ago because of a statement by um, Strawson, who had said, only because the solution exists is the problem possible. So with all 
transcendental arguments. Anyway, I thought that was kind of amazing, and I thought I'd like to look into that, so I did. So anyway, all of these cases, I think, are quite interesting and quite challenging. Um, screen, screen seven, please. Um, but I won't discuss them today. Um, instead, I want to come closer to the moral domain as is appropriate for this um, series. Um, so regarding um, explanations and arguments and indeed discourse in general, since it's communicative, it concerns relationships between people and thus can be e evaluated from a moral point of view. So we can raise questions about moral questions about discourse. Um, for example, one might maintain that a kind of discourse furthers well being or harms it, expresses regret or disregret, conveys needed information or disguises it. Such evaluative claims will often have a grounding in logic, epistemology, or linguistic analysis, and yet they are often ethical in nature and highly significant as such. I'm thinking here about broad claims of types of discourse, particularly arguments or types of arguments, or explanations. Here, flaws may be found, and some may have moral significance, as for example, in a case where a faulty appeal to a authority lures people into using a harmful product. So I'm now going to um, just say a couple of words about deceptiveness and intent to deceive as I'm using those concepts here. Accounts of fallacy in argument characteristically emphasize deceptiveness. An argument seems to be cogent, though it contains a type of mistake. It's seeming cogent when it is not means that it is deceptive. And if it is of a type that is deceptive, it exemplifies a fallacy. Here I, I um, in the sense of, uh, okay, here I would emphasize that discourse may be deceptive in the sense of tending to deceive without the arguer being a deceiver in the sense that the person intends to deceive. One may communicate through argument or other means in a manner that is deceptive without intending to do so. Accordingly, analyses finding flaws, even flaws of moral significance in a discourse do not always establish a moral fault in the person who is the author of that discourse. Deceptive mistakes can be made unwittingly. Okay, so now I'm going to shift a little and talk about an, a, an older account offered by Robert Nozick, who talked about force and argument. And uh, he um, put forward this account in a work uh, of 1981 called Philosophical Explanations. And I know now that there are people who are very active in this area who probably weren't born in 1981. So anyway, this is when this book came out. And I do recall when it came out and I purchased this book. But um, I have to confess, I did not read all of it. It's huge and ponderous and, in my opinion, quite difficult. But his theories about argument and explanation are fortunately at the very beginning of this book, in which he favors explanation over argument. And early on, he asks, why are philosophers intent on forcing others to believe things? Is that a nice way to behave towards someone? The implied answer to this rhetorical question was no, it's not nice. And Nozick went on to offer an account of philosophy without such attempts to force people to believe things with less manipulation and more explanation. In short, he defended a way of working in philosophy without employing arguments. In this kind of philosophy, Nozick said, there would be a quest for explanation, a quest to understand, quote, how something is or can be possible. What would be sought would be understanding, not proof. Nozick claimed, quote, the philosophical goal of explanation rather than proof, not only is morally better, it is more in accord with one's philosophical motivation, unquote, page 13. 
which on this view is that of understanding. Pragmatically, Nozick agrees with the account I have offered here. The explanandum must be known or believed, whereas contrastingly, in an argument or preferred proof, it is the premises and not the conclusion that must be known or believed. Nozick comments on transcendental arguments in a way consistent with my account here. He notes that there is a difference between proving that Q on the grounds that it is a necessary condition of P, which is true and or accepted, and explaining P via Q once Q has been established. This is on page 15 of his 1981 book. So we can ex extract from this account the broad conclusion that seeking to justify a claim by offering an argument for it is morally worse than offering an explanation for that claim because the former is intentionally coercive, whereas the latter is not. Given the argumentative style of Nozick's earlier work in 1974, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, we might uh, speculate that he came to regret his own style of philosophizing and some of the cutthroat debates that his work inspired. In the later book, Philosophical Explanations, Nozick was objecting to the way many philosophers reason and communicate about philosophical topics. He was introducing a philosophical work and writing specifically about meta-philosophy. Given this context, one might think it an interpretive mistake to extend Nozick's views here to about the negative, morally negative or allegedly negative aspects of arguing to broader contexts, such as those of everyday life, science, and law. And yet, I, I was toying with this charitable restriction, but I, I think it's um, not appropriate because if trying to force people to believe things in philosophy is not nice, why then it would presumably be not nice elsewhere. I mean, if it's not nice, it's not nice. It doesn't, if you start, you know, doing science or something else, it still wouldn't be nice. Um, such terms as proof and knockdown arguments indicate that Nozick was considering deductive arguments. Not all arguments are deductive. So one might argue for another charitable restriction, suggesting that the account need not apply to empirically inductive, analogical, or conductive arguments. And yet this charitable interpretation also seems to me questionable because these arguments may have premises that the intended audience doesn't yet accept. And then the, the, there would still be an attempt to quote, force these claims upon the audience. So can you have screen 10, please? Thanks. So now let's lift, shift to another matter, that of freedom. This, this becomes somewhat um, topical right, these days, I think. In Anarchy, State, and Utopia, his, the 1974 work is, of course, a classic work in, def in defense of political libertarianism. And on that view, freedom is highly valued. One could even argue that for political libertarianism, freedom is the only value. For them, if one person attempts to force another person to do something and is in that sense seeking to violate that other person's freedom, this agent is committing a profoundly important moral offense. Freedom is the moral trump card in this context, no pun intended. Yet the libertarian view is open to criticism on the grounds that there are values other than freedom, well-being, fairness, truth, for instance, a definitive negative evaluation of arguing cannot be warranted simply by the fact, if it is indeed a fact, that it involves attempt to, an attempt to violate the freedom of another person. Even if we were to grant such a claim, it would not suffice to support the negative moral evaluation of the argument, given the relevance of other values to that judgment. Okay, so I'm now shifting topics a little bit and uh, moving to explanations of what I call the phenomenon of luring explanations. Um, so yeah, I need screen 11, um, good. In explanations, 
We do not attempt to support claims, but rather to offer understanding of phenomena that are accepted as real. Uh, we do not seek to justify or offer reasons in the sense of epi epistemic support for the explanandum claim. There are nevertheless ways in which explanation can go wrong and be deceptive, deceptive, even in seriously harmful ways. No doubt there are many such ways. Here I shall describe only one concerning the status of the explanandum claim, which I refer to here as capital E. It is appropriate to offer an explanation of E only if there is a strong presumption in favor of E. That is to say, only if E is true or reasonably believed believe to be true. There is no need to explain the truth of a false claim. For instance, there is no Um, I'm not entirely sure I could try and do a finger puppet show in the meantime. Um, Kat, I think I'm back on. Hi, Trudy. Great. Wonderful. So let me start the PowerPoint again, if that's okay. Do you know where you are? Um, okay, I'll just kind of wing it here, getting going again. I, I've introduced this claim called luring explanations. And this is when a person offers an explanation, which is inappropriate because the phenomenon that is allegedly explained never happened. So my example of this um, concerns someone who might offer an explanation of why did the royal family seek to have royal Di Princess Diana killed? Now, if they never did seek to have her killed, then it's inappropriate to explain why they sought to have her killed. And uh, if it, so that that was it's such an explanation, I argue, could lure people into believing that the phenomenon was real. That is, if we explain it, we presume that it was real. So if we offer to people an explanation, then we're strongly implying that this thing happened. And since we offer as what, what we offer as an explanation, we're not giving an argument to the effect that it did happen. We're not purporting to justify that claim, but we are offering an account of how that claim to be and that claim is inappropriate. And um, you can give uh, similar examples quite, quite easily um, to hit a more timely one. Why did democratic politicians establish their organizational for center for pedophilia in the basement of a Washington pizza parlor? Well, I mean, there's various reasons this might have happened. The pizza parlor might have had a really convenient uh, basement or the centrality of location might have been convenient and so on and so forth. But this explanation is not needed if there was no such phenomenon in the first place. So I claim that these, these kind of things can be sort of luring explanations and that they lure people into believing that the phenomenon did uh, exist when it actually did not. And it is my suspicion that conspiracy theories um, can really get going in this context. You can have a whole um, sequence of such luring explanations. Anyway, I'm ju really just giving this example to make the point that um, it's not only in arguments there can be flaws, it's in explanations and these can be um, deceptive and uh, people can use them in an intent to deceive if they know that they're deceptive. So clearly, um, and there are, I'm sure, many other things that could be said about explanation and moral matters, but just, just to make the point that it's not obvious that there's a great moral superiority of explanation over argument in the, because of this kind of thing. Um, so now looking back at arguments, of course, there are many ways arguments can go wrong, and I list some obvious things here. Um, and I, again, would make the point that um, when arguments are deceptive, it doesn't always follow that the arguer himself or herself is intending to deceive. So, okay, let's, let's go on with this. Um, can we have screen 13, please? Okay, so now I'm returning to Nozick 
and the negative evaluation of arguments on the grounds that we're trying to, uh, when we argue, we're trying to force beliefs on people, force people to change their mind, force them to believe things, and this isn't very nice. Um, or you kind of put it in stronger terms and say it's really immoral because it's an evasion of the other people's freedom. So when Nozick put this idea forward, he didn't actually offer support for it, but John Casey in later work has done that and defends uh, Nozick's account here on the belief, on the grounds that belief is involuntary. We cannot believe by fiat. Now, when Casey refers to this, he uh, very wisely acknowledges that the voluntariness or involuntariness of belief is a complicated topic. And um, I agree with this. I used to be interested in this long ago, but I'm by no means would I be up to date on it of late. Um, but just, I do agree that you can't believe by fiat. And there's a thought experiment that people perform in this context. Just try to, to do it, you know, try to believe Canadians that Justin Trudeau will retire at age 55. Well, I think you're gonna find you can't. Uh, I find that I can't. Um, so to be sure you can do some things to affect your belief. And of course, Pascal argued this long ago in the context of religious beliefs. You can select your sources, you can ignore certain kinds of evidence, you can associate with various people, you can um, involve yourself in rituals or not, and so on. Um, anyway, just uh, let's go on now to screen 14. Um, okay, so Casey says that given the example, given the fact that belief is involuntary, if a person changes her beliefs, she will not do so voluntarily. So therefore, if someone else causes a person to change her beliefs, he will do it um, by causing her to something to happen to her, something that she doesn't voluntarily do. And this will amount to forcing her, believe, her to believe something. And so this is uh, a backup then of Nozick's claim that the one person restricts the other's freedom and it's in a way that is, quote, not nice. Um, so I have an example here. Maybe I, uh, well, I guess I can uh, use this example. So um, this is a case where Joseph seeks to con convince Sheila of a claim. And Sheila, jo Joseph offers some reasons and Sheila considers Joseph's claims and uh, changes her mind. So she has come to believe a claim C on the result of the argument Joseph put forward. If belief, belief is involuntary, Sheila has involuntarily come to believe C. And that has helped happened as a result of Joseph's arguing the point. We might say at this point that Joseph has forced Sheila to change her beliefs, or we would more colloquially say, change her mind. For Nozick, Sheila's freedom has been restricted by Joseph in a way that is not nice, and there is a clear moral negative in the case because it amounts to a violation of Sheila's freedom. For Casey, it would be true that Joseph has forced Sheila to believe something, but um, uh, and Joseph, Nozick then moves on from this to say that philosophers should avoid uh, efforts to to force people's thinking in this way, uh, but Casey does not make such a claim. So if you can show me screen three, 15, please. So we can notice here that Sheila wouldn't have to be involved in an interactive argument, argumentative process for this alleged forcing to occur. She could be reading an article and change her mind as a result of reading the article. So then you might say, um, has she been forced by reading this article to change her mind? And if so, should the process leading to it get a negative moral evaluation? Perhaps the article of the article, the author of the article is responsible for violating Sheila's freedom. Has he done it in some way by invading her belief system to force her to think in a new way? It does not seem plausible to say so. Though I confess my inability to spell it out. I suspect that something has gone wrong with questions about communication and the voluntary 
or involuntary nature of belief. Anyway, I, I can't pursue this interesting idea. Um, can we have 16? Anyway, Casey um, offers relief on this point, um, claiming that when people agree to um, address arguments by either by interchanges with other people or by, by reading articles and so on, when they agree to do this, they agree to have their beliefs challenged. And so they, they are actually um, sort of testing the strength of their beliefs by doing this and they consent to do this, which means that it is not wrong for the arguers to make these efforts to change their beliefs. So this is now, this is my analogy. This isn't, uh, John Casey isn't responsible for this. It would be like voluntarily testing your strength in a boxing match. The idea would be that if you were hit and knocked over, to be sure you involuntarily fall over, but it's not a case of assault, provided you consented to engage in the match. So this consent then is supposed to relieve us from this um, general negative moral evaluation of argument. Um, okay, so I personally think that Casey's account is much more plausible than that of Nozick. And it allows a morally positive role for argument despite its incorporation of the idea that arguing, people seek to force others to change their minds, something they can only do involuntarily. Okay, so I'm gonna bring all this to an end. Um, I don't think, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I don't think Nozick's negative moral evaluation of argument is warranted. We need to support our claims and theories with evidence and reasons explanations do not do this. Our arguments offering support for claims cannot be functionally and effectively replaced by explanations. Both arguments and explanations can be flawed in various ways. These flaws may be deceptive. On occasion, those offering flawed arguments or explanations may be intending to deceive. If so, they are open to moral criticism. The possibilities are numerous. Just to begin, one may say that inferences may be incorrect and hasty, and that whether as premises or explanandum, unwarranted or implausible claims may be communicated without support. I submit that there is no general superiority of explanation over argument in these regards. Sometimes speakers are unaware of the flaws they communicate in their explanations and arguments, discourse, though not its agents, may said to be, be said to be morally flawed. Sometimes speakers and writers know full well what they are doing. In that case, they are seeking to deceive and for that reason, open to moral criticism. Okay, well, thanks for bearing with me and my various technological issues and for uh, attending this meeting this morning. Uh, so let us thank our speaker for this wonderful talk and also for her to live through this complete failure of, of Zoom. Um, and I'll stop recording.